Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18, and this is what it says. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. Pray with me. Jesus, breathe your power through us that we might know your presence, your strength in relationship, not one day, this day, and be thankful. And may we be thankful. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I have a good friend that I've had since high school. Uh, he and I still get together sometimes. He's been a doctor for a long time. As a matter of fact, at one point he was a he taught at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. And a little while back, he told me a story about his parents coming to visit him. And they got up one morning and he said, his mom didn't look so good. He said, mama, how do you feel? She said, well, I don't feel so good. He said, well, I've got a blood pressure cuff and an oximeter. Let me get your blood oxygen level and your blood pressure. So he got her blood oxygen level and her blood pressure. And he said, mama, I need to take you to the emergency room right now. She said, no, I need to go home to see my doctor. And he said, no, mama, I need to take you to the hospital now. She said, well, who are you? And my friend said, it's like she didn't know what I did for a living. <laughs> and I said, don't worry. That's called the powdered bottom syndrome. Once you've powdered someone's bottom, you don't want to take advice from them, even if they are a doctor giving you health advice. <laughs> well, it's true. Who makes a difference? And if it's your child, you tend not to want to take so much advice from them. That who makes a difference? We know that who makes a difference. Every time your phone rings, what do you do? You look at it to see who. And if you recognize the number, you answer in a little bit different way than if you don't recognize the number. This past week, I called someone who didn't recognize the number. And it was obvious they thought I was going to sell them an extended warranty. I could tell from the tone of voice, who makes all the difference in the world? Who God is? Oh, it doesn't make a little difference. It makes all the difference in the world in the way that we pray. It makes a difference in how we pray. Who makes a difference? Yes, in the, the way that we, we pray, it makes a difference in our families. It makes a difference in the way we work. It makes a difference in what we do with our time. It makes a difference in what we do with our money. I read a survey a little while back said that 24% of the people in the United States believe that God is distant. 
that he's sort of like the, the, the great watchmaker. Got things started, but really has been hands off ever since he got things started and is up to us. 21% of the people in the United States, on the other hand, believe that God is distant, but he's angry. And that he's just waiting for an opportunity to punish us. 31% in the survey understood God is not to be distant, God's involved, but angry. And that, that, that God's got this sense of, it's more like karma than it is like anything else, that what goes around comes around, that God's got this sense that you get what you deserve, you do bad, you get bad, and God is that great cop that's there involved in lives to, to make sure that people get what they deserve. Jesus came not so we would, so we would not guess who God is, so we would know who God is. That's the whole reason Jesus came. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature. So we look to the scripture to see who Jesus is showing us, the, 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 the nature of God, who God is, because who makes all the difference in the world? And what we see from reading scripture as God speaks to us and reveals himself to us in the life of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is God who seeks people to help. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning. Jesus is God who seeks people to help. Bartimaeus, the blind man, he sought him and saw him beside the road. Zacchaeus, Jesus spoke to him when he was up a tree. The ten lepers, he found them out in the countryside. That again and again and again, Jesus tells stories about a God who's a seeking God, a searching God, a God who, who pursues us. He told a story about a, a, a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. One went missing, and he didn't say, well, this is my fault. If that sheep gets what they deserve, if they get eaten by a wolf, a lion, or a bear, it's, it's their own fault. They wandered away. No, it's the shepherd that goes out and seeks the one that's lost in the story that Jesus tells. And when he finds him, he doesn't pull out a stick and start whacking on the little sheep and say, get on back to the fold. I told you not to. Get... How dare you? No. He puts him on his shoulders and he comes back and he rejoices that the one that was lost is found. Jesus tells us about the nature of God in a story about a woman who had 10 coins. One of those coins went missing. She didn't say, well, nine's almost as good as 10. No. She pulls out a lamp, she pulls out a broom, and she seeks and she searches until she finds what's missing, and then she celebrates that what, what once was lost has been found. Jesus tells a story that God's like a father, father who, who had a son, and that son took his portion of the inheritance, and he went to a distant country, and he squandered it on loose living. And the father didn't sit at home and said, well, if that boy comes back, then good riddance. I'm glad that he's gone. No, Jesus tells a story where the father kept his eyes peeled on the horizon. And in the words of Jesus, he says, while the, the boy was still a long way off, he saw him, he ran and embraced and kissed him. Maybe the most beautiful verse in the Bible, while he was still a long way off, he saw him, and he ran and embraced and kissed him. That our God is a seeking God, a searching God. Our God that we know through Jesus Christ, not from a, just a good example, or not just an ethical teaching, but the Word made flesh who, who, who dwelt among us and He lives among us today. That He lives His life through His church, the hands and feet of Christ. That when we know who He is, then, well, like right here, we know that we are the church. And the word literally means to be called out, to be called out. 
out into a world that needs to know who, who God is. A world that's longing to hear good news. And church, you're the ones to tell them. You're the ones to show them. You are the hands and feet of Christ in the world today. The living Christ, alive in you and me. That Jesus Christ is God who seeks people to help. That Jesus is God who seeks problems to solve. And that's the second thing that I want to talk about this morning. The Gospel of John starts off with, with giving the basics. It's kind of a theological basis of, of, of who Jesus is. That he's the Word made flesh. The Word that was in the beginning with God and the Word that was God. That he became flesh and he dwelt among us. But the very first story, the first story is about Jesus, the Word made flesh, at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. It's John chapter 2. Then his mother comes to him. And she brings him a problem. She doesn't give an explanation. She doesn't give the details. She sure doesn't give him a solution or a directive about how he might solve the problem. She brings to him a problem. She said, they have no more wine. Now, in the scale of things, you know, if you're weighing out, you know, world hunger, it's, it's not that big a deal. But because people matter to God... It's a big deal. It's a big deal to Jesus. And he steps in and he, he tells the servants, fill the water pots with water. Well, most of the time we think of a pot, you know, we think of something about like, like that or maybe a really big pot, a little bigger. But these were pots, stone pots made for purification. And Scripture tells us they held 20 to 30 gallons each. There were six of them, a minimum of 120 gallons. And when the servants got them filled, it says to the brim, he said, now take it to the head waiter. And they, they took some to the head waiter and the water had become wine. Well, the problem, Jesus doesn't solve with just enough wine to scoot by, just enough to, to, to squeak through the problem. It's an, a, a gracious plenty, a super abundance that our God is a gracious God. Our God is a gracious God that pays attention and seeks problems, problems to solve. Problems in the everyday, in the ordinary. Problems that are, that are yours and, and mine and theirs. A couple of weeks ago, a member of our church gave me a call told me a story that had happened to her that day. Lane Hughes called me. I love stories, and I love it when people share their stories with me. She said she was putting gas in her car, and that a uh, fellow saw the, the, the magnetic sticker on her car. It said, Roswell United Methodist Church. And he came up to her and said, do you go to that church? She said, yes, I do. He said, your church kept me from starving during covid that God's generous people, God's gracious people, the church came together. And right here on this campus, in 18 months, we fed over 43,000 meals. 43,000 meals. Not just enough to get by, not just enough to skimp through. A gracious plenty from a gracious God. And there's a world out there that is longing to hear good news. We've heard enough bad news. Good news. That Jesus Christ is alive and he lives through his church. That we served over 1,600 pounds of fresh produce grown in our own church garden. That every week over 40 meetings were here for 12-step groups. Not just enough to squeak by, but God's people Letting this, this world know that our God is a generous God. And he seeks problems to solve. And church, 
He uses you and me to do it. Jesus is God who seeks people to help. Jesus is God who seeks problems to solve. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is Jesus is God who seeks lives to save. Before Jesus was, was born, an angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and Joseph, said to Mary, you're going to have a son and you shall name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Well, that's what the, the name Jesus means. It means God saves or God rescues. Well, it doesn't just say God saves. It says he will save his people from their sins. Well, we don't, people trip over that word sin a lot. And as a matter of fact, I think most of the time folks try and avoid that word sin. And by avoiding the word, we, we, so off, we, we avoid the best part of the gift that God came for, for you and me. The part that, that transforms and changes us. That that's an, an important part of it. It's so important that that's the way the Bible starts off. To tell us the arena that we're born to. To tell us what's most natural and ordinary for humans. That when the breath of God was breathed into Adam, that almost the very next thing that God says is that it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll create a helper suitable for him. Now, a lot of times we think helper. Well, that's somebody that, you know, pick up socks and underwear, do things we want done. But that's not what that word means. The word in Hebrew right there means Savior. It's not good for the man to be alone. That's the first emotion mentioned in the whole Bible, loneliness. And, and that Adam, Adam and Eve were created for each other to save each other from loneliness. That you and I, that's the arena we live in, that we were made to save one another from loneliness. That's why we were made. Not only that, they were put in the garden to cultivate and keep it. That you and I are made for meaningful work. Not only that, Adam and Eve we're made to walk with God each day in the cool of the day. You and I were made to have a relationship with God. Not some days, not once a week, every day. And to walk. To grow that relationship. To build that relationship. To walk in that relationship with the living God. Well, Adam and Eve took that great gift that God had given the relationship to save one another from loneliness, to walk with God, meaningful work, and to trust God as they walked with God. And instead, what they did was they trusted the voice of the serpent who said, you can't trust God. He doesn't want what's best for you. And so instead, they trusted the voice of the serpent. And they ate from the tree that God told them not to eat from. And immediately it says that the, their, their eyes were open and they hid from one another and they hid from God. And when God came to walk with them in the cool of the day, God said, Adam, where are you? He said, I hid for I was afraid. That's the second emotion mentioned in the Bible. The first is loneliness. The second is fear. That when we hide from God, when we isolate ourselves from God, when we isolate ourselves from one another, we're lonely and afraid. And throughout the Bible, there's story after story after story that that's our natural habitat, our natural arena, the natural environment we live in. You don't have to do anything to be lonely and afraid. That naturally, that's what comes. That naturally, we tend to think that we can trust ourselves and not God. There's a pride that says we know better. And there's story after story after story of heartbreak and brokenness, loneliness and fear because of the sin of following what comes natural. It's why Jesus came. Not just to give us a few words worth remembering, a little advice. Not just to give us a good example. He came to give his life on the cross. For you and for me. He took on himself 
all the fear, all the loneliness, all the sin, all the pride, all those things that would destroy us, and he nailed it to the cross to take away its power once and for all. And he rose from the grave to live his life through you and through me. And together, he would live through us as the church, the church, the people who were called out to be his people in the world. And we would know his forgiveness. Forgiveness. Who doesn't need forgiveness? I know I need forgiveness. And there's a world out there that needs to know that forgiveness as well. It's a forgiveness that Jesus gave freely to you and to me. And we don't have to wrestle it from his hand. But the strange thing is, We don't receive it unless we ask. It's not because God's not willing to give it. It's that we're not willing to receive it until we ask, until we repent, until we turn. And we turn toward him and begin to lean on him and trust him. Oh, this is a, this is the message that the the world is longing to hear, this message of forgiveness. And so the church, the church, So you and me, so you and me, to let the church, the the world know that Jesus is the God who, who seeks lives to save. Jesus is the God who seeks problems to solve, that Jesus is God who, who seeks people to help. And he uses you and me to do it. He uses not just our our goodwill. He uses our gratitude in giving. This is our Giving Sunday, where we look to take the next step to give with a generous heart to God through the church, through Roswell United Methodist Church, that in this coming year, We might reach out into a world that needs to know who Jesus is. Not because of guilt, not under compulsion, but out of a generous heart. There on our website is a a button. It It says Pledge 2022. And I want to invite you to make a commitment. A commitment to God for this coming year. What you might give to His church. That it... It transforms who we are and it's used to transform the world. Or it may be that you got a card like this one. And you can fill it out and start. Start with putting your name on it. A name to pledge. A name to respond to an invitation. Your name that says, this is what I'll do. This is the next step I'll take. Because there's a world out there that's longing to hear good news. Good news that Jesus is God. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, give us the ears to hear that good news. And Jesus, give us the voices, the hands, the feet, the hearts to put it into motion, the next step, to reach out into a world that needs to know you, that's longing to to know you, to know the who, who you are. May it start this day and go into the days to come. Just in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in 
to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that He made us in His image, and what the Bible tells us is that His image is an us, is an our, when God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to Him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.